is Aaron LeBauer with LeBauer Consulting, the Cash PT Nation, and the Cash PT Lunch Hour. I'm really excited to introduce my next guest for the Cash PT Lunch Hour, John F. Barnes from the Myofascial Release Treatment Centers and Seminars. John is one of my teachers and mentors, and I was in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina a few weeks ago to take or retake his course, Myofascial Release 1. And he made some time for me so we could sit down before class on Saturday and talk about his cash-based practice, his history in physical therapy, and uh, what he's doing to create value for his patients so that they're willing to come and travel across country, pay him cash for physical therapy. John is unique. He's been in the physical therapy industry for over 50 years. He's been teaching for over 40 years. And he's owned multiple cash-based clinics for over 20 years. He started in the early 90s in uh, Paoli, Pennsylvania, and then in 1993, he opened a clinic in Sedona, Arizona, and now he's got a clinic in Malvern, Pennsylvania, and Sedona with multiple therapists in both locations, all out of network. So I'm really excited to share with you our conversation. John shares a lot of insights and tips and uh, history into what he's been doing, how he's been creating enormous value for his patients. So sit back, relax, grab your lunch, grab a pen and pencil, and I'll see you on the other side of the interview. All right. You ready? Yeah. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Again, I really, really appreciate you making the time for me to do this. It's so good to see you again. Yeah, same. Um, you know, one of the um, biggest questions or things I get from people um, in cash-based physical therapy is, you know, it's not possible. How do I do this? never seen it you know I had the kind of the unique ability to see what you had done a long time ago 16 years ago when we met what you had been doing it still wasn't very popular but so what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about your practice what you're doing to create a valuable service um, and some of the things you've seen over the years uh, because um, as a as I might have mentioned to you, <clears throat> you've been one of my mentors um, from before I was a PT at the same time, and you've been in this game a lot longer than me, like <laughs> a few times than over. most people. <laughs> <laughs> than most people. So, um, will you just like give a little bit of background um, about how you got started in physical therapy, and then even maybe like when you decided to go into private practice? Okay. I, uh, I was an athlete when I was younger, and I used to uh, run a lot, and play, I played football, I ran track, I threw the shot put, I skied, I drove motorcycles, uh, I got involved in competitive, in competitive karate and uh, weightlifting, and uh, basically I love motion, I love competition, and uh, I went down to the gym. Uh, one day to work out, and the, uh, there was nobody there to spot me. And I was squatting with somewhere over 300 pounds, and uh, I couldn't get up after a while. So I'd been a gymnast when I was younger, so I thought I'd just do a back roll, get out of it. Forgetting that when you have a 300 pound bar in your hands, your hands don't let go. <laughs> so I landed uh, very forcibly on my sacrum and lumbar area. I ripped some of the ligaments, I herniated the disc at L5. I laid there totally stunned, uh, pretty much numb from the waist down. And this short scenario I'm about to describe to you it was the basis of a lot of things I've discovered over the years that happens to us with trauma. And I'll get back into more detail later if you want, but we have a, we have a survival mechanism when we're traumatized that pulls our feeling intelligence out of our body to numb us out, to help us get through the ordeal and to save our life, but nobody paid attention to it. But that's what happened to me, so I'm laying there and I uh, was numb from the waist down and couldn't move. Eventually the numbness started to wear off and then the pain began. And my legs started to slowly move again. I had to crawl out. <laughs> it was funny to look back and think it's funny now, you know, but. So in that moment, uh, it took away everything I loved competition, motion, and life became quite a struggle. 
So I, in working out, I had a couple friends down the gym. One was a physical therapist, one was a physician, a surgeon. And hearing their, their life stories and lifestyle, uh, the physical therapist appealed to me more. It seemed like he had more active participation with the patient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could keep regular hours, you know. Right. So I went to physical therapy school thinking that I could learn more about the mind-body connection, only to get there to find out they didn't have a clue. I graduated in 1960, so here we are over 50 years later, they still don't have a clue. They completely eliminated consciousness from the equation. But we can go back to that if you want, but that's pretty much what got me into physical therapy. Yeah. Yeah, and then, so when did you start practicing physical therapy? Remember what 1960. Year? 1960. Uh, first job was as a staff therapist in a general hospital. Mm -hmm. And um, I made uh, $2 an hour. <laughs> Well, how much was gas back then? Twenty-five. It wasn't even twenty-five cents. Probably not that much. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I remember sitting there one Saturday morning, reading the paper. I had to work on Saturdays too. And the garbage men had just gone on strike, and they were making more money than I was. And yeah. Like, okay, something's wrong here. What? Um, when or what point did you get into private practice physical therapy? You had, I know you've worked and done a lot of different things, but. When did you decide, okay, I need to do it on my own or my own way? Yeah. Well, I had uh, a couple of jobs in different hospitals. I, a couple of years later, I became a chief therapist. And then I went to Westchester area to become the chief therapist there. And I was seeing all these people from out in the farm country, and they had no therapist. The other, there were those little hospitals, regional hospitals, with no physical therapy department. So I approached the uh, administrator and said, I'd glad to set up a physical therapy department for you. So they went for it because they didn't have anything and it wasn't going to cost them any money. Mm -hmm. I supplied the equipment and, um, you know, basically got a piece of the action. It wasn't much action, but, right. you know, it was a start, you know. So I did a lot of traveling. And then I was doing a lot of work in nursing homes, too, even on my lunch break. Mm -hmm. So uh, that showed me there was other possibilities besides just being in a the therapist in a the hospital, which was nothing wrong with that, but it was just a big need out there. Yeah, yeah. At that time, what was the, was insurance easy to work with, or was it, you know, was it a hassle at that point? I mean, you know, this is back in the dark ages. Right. This wasn't insurance then. Yeah, so there wasn't Treatments insurance. for $5 a treatment. Wow. Most people even then could afford that. Yeah. Um, and then slowly insurance came in, Medicare came along, and all that type of thing. And it became pretty obvious to me early on all the red tape and all that stuff with Medicare and insurance that it was going to be a big problem, and it certainly turned out that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was working in a nursing home, and the administrator of the nursing home was a fairly young man. He was a great guy. And he, um, I just, I just, you know, how intuition works sometimes. I just went up to him one day, and he had an extra room there. I said, uh, what would you think of me starting the physical therapy department here? I thought it was a great idea, you know. Yeah. So in a short period of time, it blossomed because all the people came in to visit their relatives, saw the sign, physical therapy, or heard about it, you know, that type of thing. And um, he eventually actually built me uh, an addition to the nursing home. He was so prosperous and it was so good for his uh, reputation, too. Right. You know? So he built me this nice little office with four or five treatment rooms. And, you know, but I was, you know, running the whole show, doing all the phone calls mm -hmm. and administrative work and all that type of thing. What, what uh, so, and then at some point you've, between then and what I know from being in courses with you, you um, definitely cha changed the way you practiced physical therapy. Was that, well, like, where, like, was that something that led to you o opening your clinics in Paoli and Sedona, or was, I mean, are we... I mean, where's that? Like, I know that it may take years to, you know, go through the span of time <laughs> and all the stories. But yeah. like, where did that transition come from? Being involved with the the um, skilled nursing, the hospitals, and uh, having that kind of practice versus saying, okay, now you've got your own independent practice. And what was that? Tra what was that transition like? And did it did it take uh, something to happen to say, okay, I got to break away from all these uh, kind of other um, interests? It was a combination of things. Uh, I had built my practice up to the point 
where I had over 30 contracts with various health care facilities, hospitals, extended care facilities, and private practices. Uh, it was, I had over 100 employees, so I was pulled out of patient care, which I've always loved. Mm -hmm. I got stuck in administration, which started to drive me crazy. So it was the frustration of just that. And I realized my whole personality was changing, too, because when you're in business like that and just administration, so you're deciding which is the least negative thing I can choose. Right, right. You know? So uh, I decided to sell off the contracts. And uh, at that point also, um, I'd had uh, spinal surgery. My back pain had become unbearable. But still I was hurting, couldn't move that well. And there was a point when I realized that nobody was gonna help me but me. So I started to uh, lay on my living room floor and treat myself. And as I treated myself, I found that if I put pressure into the painful or very tight areas, it started to help a bit. But I was still very strong, so I was bullying my way through. Mm -hmm. And over time, I learned that if I would slow down, if I would be more gentle and more patient, all of a sudden I had this dramatic turnaround in my ability to function. My pain levels started to drop. And then uh, I started to unwind spontaneously on the floor also. And that really shifted me around as all the structural work I was doing now was working even better. And then strange things happened. My patients started to um, unwind without me saying a word to them. And they were having incredible results. So that's when I basically started to focus on my fascia release and uh, started the practice in the pale area, mm -hmm. and we just focused on my fascia release. And by then, the insurance was full blown, and all, this, all the constant aggravations to deal with in insurance companies. And I just decided that I would do cash only. And everybody said it was crazy; it would never work. But what year was this? Early '90s. It was over 25 years uh -huh. ago. And when did you start teaching my fascia release? Just to kind of keep the timeline. Um, like Early 70s, I, 73 or something like that, I think, yeah. you know. So I've been teaching for over 40 years. Mm -hmm. So in the early 90s, you started your practice in Paoli, and right away, were, did you try to get insurance contracts, or were you like, okay, from my other experiences, I know that we're not doing that? We started, but it was such a hassle early on. My staff was going nuts. I was having very frustrated because I spent most of my time fighting with insurance companies mm -hmm. pay, getting paid hardly anything anyway. Right. It's an insult. You know? <laughs> Definitely. So I said, the hell with that, you know? Yeah. And what I found, too, is when I switched, after people had gone, this is happening now today, too, after people going through whatever insurance allows them, if they know about my fashion release, they will come to you and put their hand in their pocket and give you cash and say, will you help me? Mm-hmm. And because my fascia release helps people so dramatically and consistently, um, they send 10 of their friends who send 10 of their friends, so the word of mouth becomes very powerful. Right. You just need to start small. You, know, you need a table and a little uh -huh. space. You know? <laughs> table and some hands. Don't get big right away. Give yourself time to grow, and then once the word of mouth kicks in, it's just amazing how it takes off. Yeah. Was there, um, well, can you just uh, back up and just tell, tell everyone uh, a little bit about, you know, what is myofascial release and how does it create um, an experience for the patients that's something that they're not, they're not able to find anywhere else? In three words or less? Yeah. Okay. Like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to me, the forgotten link in healthcare has been the structural release of the fascial system. And that uh, in the past, there's an old form of myofascial release, which is pretty much is brutal. It's very aggressive, it's very mechanical, it's very painful, and it's an attempt to force the system, it can't be forced. So what it does, and it does have help, we do a little bit of that, but it, what it does is mechanically break up the cross links in the fascial system that occur from trauma. But from my own experience, I found that that just wasn't enough. So it's when I slowed down, uh, when I started to be more gentle and wait, there's a, there's a time period that turns out that allows the fluid part of the fascia system, the ground substance, to start to rehydrate. So what happens to the fascia? The fascia is a three-dimensional web, fibrous three-dimensional web. But within that web, it, it's not space. The ground substance is the fluid in there. Nobody paid attention to that. Uh, 
all the research on the fascist system has been done on dead people. As you know, dead people are brittle. <laughs> so these focus on the fibrous network, if at all, even that. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that when you go through trauma, physical or emotional trauma, there's a change in the vibration of the energy that goes through us that keeps us alive, whatever you choose to call it. And that begins to solidify that which should be fluid into a solid mass that becomes incredibly powerful. And it starts to crush nerves and blood vessels, pull joints together, basically create the symptoms we deal with every day. But traditional healthcare focused on symptoms affect, not cause. And it turns out the fascia in our consciousness is the cause of most of the symptomatic complexes that our patients present with. So the art of this is learning to find the barrier. You and I were taught protocols, but protocols don't work. They have nothing to do with the patient on the table. Mm -hmm. When you understand fascial strain patterns as you do, everyone is unique so that of the seven billion people in this world, we have seven billion different fascial strain patterns. So it's not about doing a cookie cutter kind of thing for everybody. So the art of it is to learn how to feel where the restriction is then follow the principles and wait without brute force. If we use too much force, we shut them down, they go into protection. If it's too late, it never engages the collagenous barrier. So as we wait uh, about five minutes or longer for the release, the whole bunch of phenomena begins to occur. What it turns out is all of the therapy out there that you and I learned and know about is very logical. It's well-intentioned but it's flawed because it's too quick. So it's somewhere around the five minute period to the phenomena of piezoelectricity, mechanotransduction, phase transition, which eventually leads into uh, resonance, which is another word for release. So if you don't find the barrier and then you don't wait long enough, you never get a complete release. So that's temporary results, frustration. So many of the therapists that come to my seminar, they are so frustrated, they're good people, they're very bright you're doing what they were taught, but it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. so, yep. This works because we're following principles or nature's way, basically, but we have to be patient and we have to wait a little bit. So the fascia originally was thought to be just covering of muscles. When I was in PT school, during the dissection of the cadavers, the anatomy professor would yell us, clean that up, get that stuff off of there. Now here we are in 2016, that's what they're still being told. Mm -hmm. It's not just packing material. Fascist surrounds and infuses every structure, system, and cell of our body. The ground substance is the very environment of every cell. So if we don't free up the fascial system at the cellular level, uh, all the air you breathe is not getting to the cell. All the good nutrition you may be eating is not getting there. All the water you drink is not getting there. Hydration isn't just water going down your throat, it's what's can enter the cell. So when the cell is crushed and solidified, then you're in severe distress and mm -hmm. you're physiologically in trouble. Yeah. So um, when someone comes to your clinic, they, <clears throat> they're getting a physical therapy, they're getting an evaluation, treatments, or the treatments all MFR, what else are you guys doing in your treatments to teach patients exercises or home self-treatments? and um, kind of, can you just give a little overview about how does that work for patients that may come to your clinic? Well, we go through the normal you know, evaluation and range of motion, strength testing, you know, all that type of thing. Uh, we, pump, we basically do 95% myofascial release. Mm -hmm. We also teach people how to do exercise. But if she, people come in to see us, um, they come in to see us for two to three weeks, three times a day, and then we go. They go home and hopefully or with our treatment suggestions, the therapist will follow up with the treatment regime or mm -hmm. will modify the one they were already on that wasn't working too yeah. well. Local yeah. patients, then we start them on an exercise program, but I found it's better when somebody's in a lot of pain, a lot of spasm, we actually back them off unless they're an athlete temporarily because exercise is irritating them because the fat is already too tight, it's putting more pressure on the nerves and blood vessels that are creating their symptoms. And then we'll start to slowly introduce uh, them back into an exercise program. Mm -hmm. And we do myofascial stretching, which is totally different than traditional stretching. All of traditional stretching, including yoga, basically push into end range. In fact, yoga came from the unwinding process, which I don't know if you want to talk about, but we could talk mm -hmm. about it later. Yeah. So basically, <clears throat> uh, pushing the end range, let's say you have a shoulder 
dysfunction. You can only get into flex that may be there. Think about all forms of stretching, fast, ballistic, slow, everything's in range. That only releases the elastic and muscular component, 20% of the fascia system. Mm -hmm. So instead, you go to end range, but then you telescope, and you go to end range there, and you wait, and then this unraveling occurs. It's called unwinding, which is a spontaneous movement of the body that allows for self-correction, and you get these massive increases in range. People involved in yoga practice, if they will, and a lot of the MFR therapists are doing that now. They modify the yoga principles now. Uh, it, it's much, much more effective. Yeah. In fact, yoga came from unwinding. <laughs> right. How long? It, well, what was the? What's the? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Because I haven't. About, I wanna, what? about how yoga came from the unwinding. And tell well, me yoga, what that. Yoga, un, if it, the unwinding is a spontaneous motion. I believe it's been around since the very beginning of mankind. Yeah. And so yoga has been around for a long time. And I don't know exactly. I wasn't back then. I'm not that. Right. Old, but right. <laughs> well, you're only like. 30, I feel like in the morning right, sometimes. Forty-five. Point, but. <laughs> but what they did is stylized yoga and turned it to more of a channel five experience. And I can back up and tell you more about my concept mm -hmm. of channel three and channel five. So they took the essence out of it, which is the mind. In other words, you're going through a routine. You're trying to get into certain postures. What's interesting in our practice is when people, we never try to unwind anybody. We never tell people what to think or what to feel. We treat the fashion that the body and mind spontaneously express itself. But people that have never even heard of yoga or don't even believe in yoga, doctors, lawyers, engineers, mm -hmm. you know, the linear type people, um, they'll go into these spontaneous unwindings and achieve the classic yogi positions mm -hmm. that they never heard of before. Right, right. So they're sort of ingrained in us somehow. So the way yoga has become in a lot of situations is it's become a little more mechanical and trying to mimic those positions. But the key is let your body find its position for you at that moment. Mm. There's more of a flow to it. It's more I, effective. I see. That's interesting. That's, that's a great way to look at it. Um, I want to ask, uh, back up and ask, so right now you're doing intensives at your treatment, but did you, when you started back in the 90s, were you seeing, how were you seeing patients? Were you seeing them only in intensives? Were you seeing them, you know, like eight visits and more of what might be a traditional? Yeah, yeah we were doing more 15-minute, yeah. 30-minute sessions yeah. a couple times a week, the typical physical therapy thing mm -hmm. back then. You know. And was that when you started in Paoli too, or? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. then at what point, um, did you start in Paoli with a handful of therapists as employees, or did you start just with yourself? With me. Yeah. <laughs> the frustrating part, you've probably been this, through this too, is that you start to grow and you realize you need somebody else. Yeah. You hire somebody else and your practice drops off. <laughs> you think, oh, what did right. I do? You know? But if you see a patient, unless it's sometimes therapists don't work out, as you know. Yeah. But, uh, so it just is that cycle for some. Maybe it was just me. I don't know if other people go through that, but mm -hmm. every time I grew, I get somebody to help us out, and phew, yeah, dead. Yeah, you know? well, that's uh, isn't it uh, called uh, Murphy's Law? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, how many um, how many therapists do you have um, working for you in Paoli? And what's well, Malvern now? Malvern okay. training facility. Um, that's right. Yeah, we have uh, four, five, six, depending on the. When I'm in town, it's a little busier, so mm -hmm. we have some people come in to help us out too. Okay. In that way. And then you've got a clinic in Sedona. As well, and when did you open that? In Sedona, I opened it in 1993, and uh, it was just an artist shack when I paid. I wasn't even looking for a place; I was too mm -hmm. busy. And I was giving an advanced seminar out there, and um, I drove by every morning, saw this sale sign, and then my intuition said, "Look at it." And I kept fighting with myself. I can't. I don't have any time. Why would right. I look at it? You know? Well, I looked at it, and it was incredible. And so. Uh, they had a beautiful deck and nice view, but the deck kind of shook. You know? mm -hmm. I said, is this safe? Oh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> you know? Well, I had the engineers come out. It was about to collapse. It was, an old, it was on an old avalanche, so I had yep. to have bridge builders come down and build a whole steel foundation and all that type of thing. And my accountant, I told my accountant what I was doing, and he has a plane, and he had just flown over, so down to 11,000 feet. I won't use his words, but he said, are you out of your mind? There's a bunch <laughs> of damn rocks down there. You know? So he called me a couple years after to congratulate me because we were so successful. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, people are willing to travel for my fashion release. You know, they're yeah. willing to pay cash for quality work. 
And people, there's something about my fresh release where people recognize instantaneously, intuitively, this is important to the recovery. Mm -hmm. So um, even though people have told us cash would never work, it's worked beautifully. And what it does too, when you're at risk, you'll face the hard stuff you do to really heal. People get insurance, they lay there waiting to get fixed. Right. And that doesn't work. They don't have skin in the game. Yeah. You know, they, yeah. they don't put their, yeah. Yeah, there's something different about it when you put your money behind it versus when someone else is paying. Like it's a, exactly. to me it's a, a con, like not really a conflict of interest, but just like there's no interest. It's, it's a triangulation of payment. And exactly, it destroys their motivation. Yeah. So um, what are some of the things that you've done? You've mentioned word of mouth, but like, did you, have you kind of asked people for, huh? have you asked patients to, hey, spread the word, or have you done any other marketing? What other marketing types of things have you done to kind of get the word out about your practice and what, what worked early on and maybe what's something different that's working now? It just was word of mouth and perseverance and doing good work and people talk about the good work and tell their friends. Uh, the seminars also, I get to meet a lot of therapists and physicians, and they send their difficult patients. Most people, most times when they're in my fashion, they can take care of most people, so we're there to kind of mm -hmm. take care of their difficult patients that need. The frequency from what we do is we're, we have a subconscious holding pattern in us. We all have it embedded in us. Nobody paid attention to it. And sometimes being seen three times a day for two or three weeks is what a person needs to break through that, and then the local therapist can follow up and do really good again. It's a couple of simple things I do tell therapists starting private practice. Start small, uh, give it time, be patient. Um, if you go to a doctor's office, don't expect a rousing welcome. But what you should do is talk to the office manager. Give her a five minute myofascial treatment, even behind her desk when nobody's around. Don't charge her. They know that things aren't working out too well, and they have problems too, and they'll start to send you patients, and then give her free treatment every couple months. And that that gets things cooking for you. Look for health fairs. It's not very expensive. Just order a little booth with a treatment table. Bring your appointment book and some information about you. And they have a big sign: uh, free five-minute myofascial treatments. Within 10 minutes, you'll have a line down the hallway, and mm -hmm. you'll fill up your appointment book. And I'll do it two or three of them, and you're on your way. It works really well. Yeah, yeah. that's great. So Here's another silly thing. I'll yeah, another tell quick it. One. <laughs> Go to the local hairdressers. Women talk to their hairdresser more than they do the priest or minister. Right, you know, right. And give the hairdresser free treatment, and maybe she'll hand out some of your brochures, and they'll start to refer people to mm -hmm. it. I've had a bunch of people with... Uh, like post-surgical, like uh, bunionectomies, come from one hairdresser. Really? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like probably five or six people in the last year, just because one person had told her about what we were doing and, and everything. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing how you find these one or two people or, you know, dozens of people who will refer, you know, a whole bunch of people, and they haven't even met us. So, I mean, it's... So that's where you got the little curly cue in your hair? Yes, there? that's where I got it's the nice. curly cue yeah. in my hair. It was longer about three weeks ago. <laughs> um, is there, like, um, I've got a couple other questions um, that I want to ask. Uh, a lot of people have, like, this misconception that we need to convince patients to pay for physical therapy or, you know, patients won't pay more than their copay for physical therapy. Is there something that... I mean, that you're doing that's, you know, I guess the question I want to ask, which isn't really the question, but it's how do you convince someone to come see you and pay so much more than their copay? Which is, that's the common question I get. Um, and so I just wanted to see, see what your answer to that would be. Well, I understand that question, and it usually comes from therapists that have never been injured. One of the things I say is that, and I don't really mean it, but Every physician and therapist should be severely injured and not be in trouble for a month or two, but a year or two. Realize what it's like to be stuck in prison and have your life taken from you. Mm -hmm. When you're hurting that bad, you've got to get help. And there's something about my fashion. It works, speaks for itself. I don't have to convince anybody. The work speaks for itself. And so when you start to treat people and it's just, they just send their friends and they're very thankful and you're doing what you went into the therapy profession to do is to help people in a very significant way. 
everybody that comes to see us, unfortunately, they've been to many different therapists, many different professions, and they got nowhere. They spent all this money. People come from around the world to see us now, but they got mm-hmm. nowhere. Traditional therapy, as logical as it is, only produces temporary results, and they're furious about it. So it's very easy, because yeah. it's not that like, I can't, I would never even say this is gonna work. I just start, I just walk in and I treat them, and all of a sudden I say, oh my God, this is what I've been looking for. You know, so mm-hmm. It's an awareness that comes across them. Yeah. It's yeah. very natural. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I see that, I see that a lot. Um, and I think part of it is, there, there are a lot of people who um, might be watching this, you know, are like, oh, I don't really, I don't get that. You know, it, it doesn't sound, it'd make logical sense. Um, well, I'll punch you out. And you'll start to get it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Pain drives you. Right. Right. You know, I've also noticed there are a lot of therapists that don't get treated themselves or don't treat themselves. Yeah. What's the? What would your be advice for that? And what's the best way to, you know, for a therapist to start doing that? You know, get treating themselves or, or doing something yeah. to take care of themselves. Well, that's one of the primary things I teach too: is how to treat yourself and how to teach your patients to treat themselves. It's very, very important. Uh, life, life goes on, life's full of stresses, we're always injuring ourselves to some degree. So once the therapist gets you out of trouble, it's really important the patient participate too, and even during the treatment, as they're seeing mm-hmm. you. Uh, it, first of all, it ends up making your job easier as the therapist, but more importantly, it helps them make better progress. And now you've given them a lifetime skills so that they'll cut their cost way down. Yeah. You know, and that makes a huge difference for people. And I think treating yourself isn't just something you do to get yourself out of pain or move better. I think it has to become a way of life. And we're not talking long, 5, 10, 15 minutes a day, maybe a little bit longer on the weekends, you know. Mm-hmm. And it feels so good, it's worth it. Yeah. You know, I tried traditional therapy for years, and so do most of our patients. They don't do it because they know it doesn't work. We have a skill enhancement program. People come in from all the country, therapists come in from all across the country. And I was kidding, but the, we ask them, what do you want? They've never asked for ultrasound mm-hmm. or hot packs. They want my fast release. Right. <laughs> <laughs> ultrasound. We still learn that in school, or at I, least I did 10 years ago, or seven years ago. I we had to learn do. ultrasound. Yeah. Yeah. They were going to get rid of, this is about a decade ago, they were going to get rid of diathermy. Everybody yeah. bitched to moon because, well, it's been around forever. Well, it hasn't worked for every year, so what do you... Right, right. But this is I think it's back. Our <laughs> integrated mindset there. About, you know, right. It doesn't work, move on. What, what is it about touching someone with your hands that that's so powerful? Because I, I do get a lot of patients who've never been touched where they hurt. And what is it about the touch, the human touch, that's, like, that's so powerful in even just like laying your hands on someone, even if it's not just myofascial release, but when you add myofascial release to it, there's another dimension. But there's something about just being touched or having that kind of one-on-one attention. Yeah. It? Well, I'm sure you believe this too. I think it's a basic human need. It, it basically infers love and caring. It's a touch that a lot of people have never had because there's no expectations or force involved. It's life-changing. And the touch that we use with myofascial release is very gentle, it's very steady, and it creates a connection between therapists, a bond that occurs between the therapist and the other person that allows them to basically go into the deeper aspects of who they are as a human being. To me, uh, safety, trust, love in our society is a word, not a true experience. Mm -hmm. And this gives people that experience. So they can start to grow again and be themselves. And, you know, we all got pretty heavily programmed, and uh, most of us were pretty cerebral. And of course, touches had a bad connotation too, because many times sex has been involved, and you know, mm-hmm. that's been a problem. But this doesn't feel like that. This is structural. This is caring. It's a whole different world, and people just love it. Yeah. Yeah. We teach families to do it too. We have a Jungian seminar too. We found that it's wonderful bonding for the family. Not can they help themselves cut their costs, but again, establish that love connection again that sometimes in a relationship you tend to lose. You know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What, so um, what are your, like, it's 2016, where do you see yourself in, like, five, ten years? Dead. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you have, like, plans for... <laughs> no, no. You know, like, what, what are your plans for you and your, and your, and your practice and business? I just, I just want to keep doing what I'm doing. I love what I do. People say, when are you going to retire? I said, I am. Yeah. I just can't imagine myself sitting down in the basement banging out birdhouses. You know? right. 
With my fascia release, uh, it's very special for the therapist also. I've never f experienced anything, and I've tried just about everything, where there's such a deep connection, and you're so totally involved physically, emotionally, mentally with, with the person and yourself, you know. Mm -hmm. So I feel this is very important work, and I want to see it spread throughout the world, and it's happening. And um, as long as I can, I'm going to keep it going and growing it and helping people. You know. Great. I enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that uh, I, I mentioned to you the other day is that I'm getting ready to hire um, some staff and some physical therapists. Do you have any advice for anyone who has a cash-based practice and wants to hire you know, multiple other therapists? Well, as you know, some people look good at doing an interview, yeah. and then you see them interact with people, and it can be disastrous. You have to be really uh, careful observe them very carefully once they get started too and really listen to the feedback from the patients. Mm -hmm. Some patient will be upset because you're special to them so they're not going to be satisfied with anybody else but you. Mm -hmm. But that most people overcome that. Uh, I feel it's really important for they to treat you or your other staff a number of times so you can really get a sense of their touch. Uh, their being ability to center themselves, you know, their personality mm -hmm. comes through their touch too. So it's really important that they treat you to make sure they have the hands-on skill. Anybody can take a course that doesn't mean they have the hands-on skill, mm -hmm. right? And um, yeah. oh, that's great. So um, you just want to wind up the uh, the our time together. What what I want you to do is just let me know or let uh, the listeners know where can they find more about you. I know you've got a blog, you've got a website. So, what are some of the places they can find you here? <laughs> we do have a website, myfashionalist.com. And then we're on Facebook under my name, John F. Barnes, where we also have uh, MFR Insight. Uh, so, that's a closed group. So, you're w just welcome. This might take a couple days mm -hmm. for us to, so you're welcome to get on here. Whether you've taken my fashion release or not, it's, that's not important. You're welcome to participate. And patients are on there too, and their insights are really invaluable for us too. Right, right. And then um, you have, uh, don't you have a blog where you write about Mafash release? Oh, yeah. I'm on Massage Magazine. They have a blog there that I write about regularly, too. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, I'll put, the, I'll put the links to those when I, public, when I post the video in the show notes. And, John, I just want to, I know we could go on. I've got a, a ton more questions, but um, I know we've got a course to start. And I just want to thank you again for being here. It's been You're the greatest. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank yeah, it's really great. Where's your hairdresser? I like that little. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> that's natural. And Is it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you gotta have you gotta have uh, red hair and uh, curls <laughs> for that one. <laughs> Remember the this little cartoon, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, I think it was, and one of them had a little like a little like a little yes. curly. <laughs> John Travolta had one in Greece. You're a good interviewer. Thank you, John. <laughs>